June 2019, Shubham Mani Tripathi was riding his motorcycle through the Indian state of Uttar Pradesh when he was shot multiple times and killed. The 25-year-old journalist had received dozens of phone calls telling him to stop his investigations. But Tripathi wasn't looking into drug trades or investigating corrupt politicians. No, he was investigating the state's illegal sand mining. Sand. It might conjure up images of summer holidays, rolling dunes and endless beaches, but it's also one of the most important resources on the planet. It's in our windows, it makes our buildings, it lays our roads, and it's used in vital industry. And the problem is, we're running short. This is Beyond the Headlines, I'm James Haynes-Young, and this week we're delving into the murky world of the global sand trade, and looking at why we're running out. Well, first of all, I mean, when I started out on this, I had no idea that there was such a thing as a global sand shortage. You know, I barely even knew that sand was anything that we used at all. But come to find out, indeed, it turns out to be the most important solid substance on Earth. It's an incredibly important natural resource. That was Vince Bezer, a journalist and author of the book The World in a Grain of Sand, who has spent years investigating the world's sand shortage. And he's right. Sand is one of the world's most used resources, after water and air. It's literally the foundations of our cities and of modern civilization. Sand is the essential ingredient in concrete. When we're making our buildings, we might need glass for them, again made of sand. And then there's the silicon chips in your computer or phone, the very one you're listening to this podcast on. They're also made of sand. Humans use 15 billion tonnes of sand every single year. Here's Vince putting that into context. And just to give you an idea of the the scope and the scale of the city building that is happening in the world, it is way beyond anything that's ever happened before in human history. Give you an idea, in 1950, there were about 750 million people worldwide living in cities. Today, the number of people living in cities is about 4 billion and it's climbing every single day. We are adding the equivalent of nine New York cities to the planet every single year. And the use of sand isn't new. No, we've been making concrete and blowing glass for millennia. Even the ancient Egyptians used sand to transport the bricks to make the pyramids. People have been using sand, melting down sand to make glass for for, uh, ornaments and tableware since at least the times of ancient Babylon. The Romans, uh, concrete has been around since at least Roman times. The Romans used a lot, had somehow discovered the secret of concrete and used a, built a lot of buildings. Uh, The Pantheon, a 2,000 year old building in Rome today is, the roof of it is made out of concrete, 2,000 year old concrete dome. So we've been using it for, mostly for construction for millennia, but it's always been, so it's always been kind of important. It's always been one of the things that people have used. But it was really, it's really only in the last 100, 150 years with the advent of the Industrial Revolution, with the advent of the modern world as we know it, that sand went from being kind of a niche product to the baseline commodity that pretty much all societies use in enormous quantities. And the number one reason for that is concrete. Like I said, the Romans knew about concrete, but really it sort of faded out when the Roman Empire collapsed. Nobody built anything with concrete for about 1,500 years after the Roman Empire collapsed. But in the late 1800s, in the United States and Western Europe, as the Industrial Revolution was kicking into gear, as more and more people were moving into cities, as the scientific revolution was kicking into gear, inventors, innovators started tinkering around and kind of rediscovered concrete and figured out ways to make it stronger than it's ever been before. Putting in those iron bars, if you've ever walked by a construction site, you might've noticed those steel bars sticking out of a concrete that's being poured. That's reinforced concrete. This discovery of reinforced concrete set us on a path to becoming heavily dependent on sand. In the early 1900s is when people really realized, wow, This concrete stuff, this artificial stone, is amazing. It's cheap, it's easy, you can get the raw materials for it everywhere. 
we can build modern cities out of it. As more and more, as the population was growing really fast and more and more people moved into cities, concrete really became the number one building material of choice, first in the Western world and then all around the world for buildings, for high rises, for the roads that became increasingly important, as the car became increasingly important. And really, as the world uh, developed and as more and more people moved into cities, concrete just completely took over the world. And it's as a result of that, it's as a result of the choice to rely on concrete that we have the world that we live in now, that we live in concrete buildings, that we drive on concrete roads, that we have airports where airplanes land on concrete. Concrete gave us the power to dam rivers, right? Every major dam around the world, from the Aswan Dam to the Colorado Dam, made out of concrete. You could not build a dam like the Aswan Dam out of bricks, right? Concrete has given us this incredible power uh, over nature to, to build roads in places where there, you could never build roads before, to build uh, skyscrapers. Before concrete came around, the tallest building in the world was 10 stories high. And that was considered a, a miraculous, incredible innovation. That was only 100 years ago. Now, in Dubai, you've got the Burj Khalifa, the, the tallest building in the world. What's it made out of? It's made out of concrete. And P.S., they had to bring sand in for that building all the way from Australia. Which gives you an idea of how, uh, you know, what a global commodity sand has become. By now, you must be thinking that there's no way we're right. There must be enough sand alone in the Sahara Desert to keep us going forever. No? Well, Vince explains why desert sand is simply no good. So you're sitting there in the United Arab Emirates at the edge of one of the biggest piles of sand in the world, the Arabian Desert. How can there possibly be a shortage of sand? The answer is all that desert sand, pretty much all desert sand around the world, is no good to us. Uh, it is not useful for anything. And the reason for that is the grains are the wrong shape. Desert sand has been shaped by wind over thousands and millions of years. The wind has tumbled and tumbled those grains. And that's given it kind of a rounded, those grains a rounded, smooth shape. Whereas the, the grains of sand that you find at the bottom of rivers or on beaches, sand that's been eroded by water, is much more angular. It's, much, um, it's got more corners and edges. So that river sand, that angular sand, locks together much better to form a solid substance, to form that concrete, whereas that desert sand does not. It's like the difference between trying to build something out of a, out of a pot, huge pile of tiny little bricks as opposed to a pile of tiny little marbles. So you're right. There are billions of tons of sand on the planet, but a lot of it's just not good enough. The grains of sand in the desert are rounded smooth by the wind. In construction, you want your sand to have jagged edges, so the grains lock together tightly, making your concrete or your foundations strong. And the best kind of sand for that is riverbeds. Sand of this kind takes millennia to form. Rocks are worn down and erode and eventually enter rivers. Although it can run down to the oceans, where the sand can be mined as well, Sea silt corrodes machinery more quickly, making it more expensive and difficult to extract than in freshwater. But the amount of sand we need every year is simply more than the Earth can produce. And on top of that, the mining processes cause a lot of disruption to ecosystems. Here's Vince again. When you tear up the bottom of a riverbed like that, well, first of all, you just anything that was living on the bottom of that river, any kind of fish, shellfish, Plant life, you've just annihilated their habitat, wiped it out. Secondly, you stirred up, when you stir up all that sand and silt and mud that was down there, you cloud up the water, right? It, it throws all that stuff up into the water and makes it really murky, which can literally suffocate anything that was swimming in that water. Again, any kind of fish um, or, or mammals like dolphins that might have been swimming to make their, you know, that spend their lives swimming in that water, they can literally choke to death on that silted up water. Third, all, that, um, all the silt in the water blocks the sunlight from getting through the water down to the plants that need it to survive. Underwater plants need sunlight, just like plants above the, that are above the water. Aside from the impact on wildlife, the erosion of riverbeds and coastal areas can have a big impact in countries. 
Aurora Torres is a postdoctoral fellow at the Université Catholique de Louvain in Belgium and Michigan State University, who has studied the impact of sand mining and says stripping away coastal sand can leave shorelines defenseless. One of the uh, most investigated impacts of sand mining in river systems or in coastal areas is the increased erosion of uh, river sites or coastal areas. And in these cases, the extraction of sand from these places uh, may reduce the amount of sediment that is reaching coastal regions and they're affecting the coastal dynamics. And in other cases, we are just removing a natural barrier and a natural defense against um, natural hazards such as storms or tsunamis. So, for example, the tsunami in the Indian Ocean um, had in places like Sri Lanka maximized effects because of the intensive uh, coastal extraction of sand that was happening there before. Climate change increases the likelihood of storms, making regions stripped of sand more vulnerable. But at the end of the day, we have a voracious appetite for sand to build our ever-expanding cities. And as with any lucrative trade, for high-demand products where supply might be hard to secure, there's organised crime. Shubhab Mani Tripathi is just one of the dozens of activists, local community organisers, politicians and journalists who have been murdered for speaking out about the illegal sand trade. Here's Vince. If you really get in their way, they will kill you. Hundreds of people have been murdered in India, Indonesia, Mexico, Ghana, Kenya, the list goes on and on all around the world just in the last few years. And that's not counting hundreds and hundreds more that have been assaulted, beaten, tortured, kidnapped by these sand mafias, as they're called. Organized crime gangs that go around literally stealing sand, seizing land that they have no right to, uh, tearing up the topsoil, often ripping up the uh, Uh, crops, agricultural land, cutting down trees to get at the sand that's underneath it and sell it to developers. And those gangs have gotten so big and so powerful and there's so much money at stake that in a number of countries around the world, they do what organized crime does anywhere. They pay off judges, government officials uh, to leave them alone. Although criminal activity is active, Aurora says that it's just one end of the illicit mining trade. So there is a whole range from informal extraction that is socially accepted by the community and where there is mainly subsistence mining to sophisticated illicit supply networks. So in many places of the world, sand is just extracted informally by family or small companies without specific permission. But if the sand is extracted in low amounts, quite often this is not perceive as a, as a reason of concern for the local communities. The problem starts when the demand for these resources increases rapidly and then is increasingly perceived as an alternative source of income. There is a whole range and this informal spectrum of sand mining that needs to be considered because in many cases also these informal activities are a critical source of income for local communities. And we have to consider that. Many communities across the world have come to rely on sand mining for income, even if the cost is to their local surroundings. But with the high impact on people, animals and the planet, what can be done to end our addiction to sand? Well, not a lot. Here's Vince again. There's no real alternative to sand. It's not like oil where we could, we can see a way that eventually we can switch over to renewable uh, fuels and, and, get rid, and stop incurring all the environmental damage that comes with fossil fuels. Sand is really, it's a concrete, which is the number one thing that we use sand for. It's a wonderful building material. It's really great. It's really strong. It's cheap. It's easy to work with. And it's provided housing and roads and all kinds of other benefits for billions of people all around the world that just wouldn't have been possible any other way. But we are, we've are we got to do something about the damage that's coming with this. There is research going into finding alternatives to sand, 
In 2018, researchers at the University of Bath in England found waste plastic may be able to partially replace sand in building. Others are looking at ways to grind down existing concrete and recycle it, and some are looking at concretes that require less sand entirely. There are people in laboratories all around the world trying to find viable alternatives. Here's Vince. And there's a lot of research going on around that, uh, around the world. There's, there are folks uh, looking into making concrete with, with other substances instead of sand, using things like shredded plastic or shredded rubber or, or ripped up bamboo, or coming up with new types of concrete that would last much longer, so you wouldn't need to produce as much concrete as we are. So all those, there's some very promising uh, technologies like that in the works. None of them are really uh, commercially viable on a big scale yet. They're being tried out here and there. There's a little patch of highway in the Netherlands that's been made out of concrete that uses nothing but shredded old tires. There's folks in India working on uh, concrete made out of shredded plastic, which would be great because you know that could be a double win if we could get rid of all our garbage plastic and uh, reduce the need for sand. Same time, fantastic. But at the moment, all those things are mostly kind of still in the laboratory phase. They're a long way from really replacing sand on a, on a major scale. But with alternatives still a long way off, Aurora is wary of quick solutions. Well, it's tricky. Um, let's start from the fact that we should be doing several things, not just looking for alternatives, because... It's not easy to find an alternative that is going to be more sustainable than sand and gravel because these are resources that are extremely cheap compared to other resources and that are consumed in huge volumes. So we have to look very carefully at the alternatives to ensure that we are not just shifting the problem to, to other things. So if we can't find an alternative, what options do we have? Here's Vince again. So there's a few things we can do. One is better rules and regulations about sand mining, where we take sand from, how much of it we take, uh, what sorts of methods we use to extract it. So I'll tell you in, um, you know, in most of the developed world, uh, in the United States, in Western Europe, they have, there is environmental damage that goes along with sand mining, but it's not nearly as bad as what you find in a lot of developing countries like India, China, and so on really because uh, we've got a pretty good set of rules and regulations around it, and crucially because we have good enforcement of those regulations. So in India, for instance, they've got lots of great rules on the books about you know, all kinds of environmental protections that are they, people are supposed to observe, but because there's so much corruption in the system, people just ignore those laws. So that's one thing we can really do that could uh, limit the damage is uh, better rules, better regulations, better enforcement. But ensuring global enforcement in an industry that has some shady operators willing to kill to protect their trade is an uphill struggle. So if you ask me, the only real solution is we actually have to kind of reframe the question. The question isn't really, how can we use less sand? Because that's a very, it, it's a very familiar problem, right? Find out that we're using too much sand. Well. We, we know, anybody who's paying attention to the news knows, we're using too much fresh water. We're cutting down too many trees. We're taking too many fish out of the oceans. And now come to find out we're, we're running out of sand, of all things. Well, to my mind, these are not separate problems. They're all symptoms of the same problem, which is simply that we are consuming too much. And by we, I mean human beings who live in wealthy, developed countries like the United States, like Canada, like the United Arab Emirates. You know, the, the way of life that, um, that was pioneered in, in the West, you know, the idea where everybody has their own home and they drive their own car on a, you know, six-lane freeway to a big office tower and they shop in big glitzy shopping malls. That kind of life lifestyle just is not sustainable on a planet with 7 billion people on it. It's fast on its way to having 9 billion people. We have got to find ways to live our lives and to build our cities, which is where most people now live, cities. We've got to find ways to build those cities that simply consume less, that are more sustainable, that not only use less sand, but that use less of everything. 
to shrink our footprint and make come up with a lifestyle that's more sustainable. Sand has literally changed the very landscapes we live in, altered the course of modern civilization, and impacted the lives of every single person on the planet. But we've become dependent on a resource that requires tearing up the earth in ever greater quantities. We have few alternatives on the horizon. Our only option for now may be to try and reduce consumption. This will likely take international cooperation, like we're seeing in areas such as climate change. But as we've seen there, even the best of intentions may not be enough to slow or halt disaster. You've been listening to Beyond the Headlines. I've been your host, James Haynes Young. Thanks this week to Vince Bezer and Aurora Torres. This episode was produced by Aisha Khan, Taylor Heyman, and Arthur Edison. If you've enjoyed this and want to hear all the latest episodes of Beyond the Headlines as soon as they air, just hit the subscribe button in your podcast app. And while you're there, why not leave us a review? It makes a big difference. <laughs>